These have been challenging times, but the body of Christ has proven itself resilient. We've gathered in different ways, in different places, yet stood steadfast as the church. We have found peace in God's promise to never leave us or forsake us. In our separation, we have remained united. In our struggle, we have lived out our faith. In the midst of the unknown, we have leaned on the strength of an all-knowing God. Throughout history, the church has thrived in adversity, and this moment is no different. The power of God is unstoppable, His love unending, His grace unrelenting, His glory undeniable. Today, no matter where we gather, we remain God's people. Our mission has not changed. Our calling has not been altered, and nothing, absolutely nothing, will ever change that. We are the church, and today we stand resilient. Man, it's so great to be with you guys, whether in person or worshiping online, and we're celebrating today because last Sunday at Easter, we had 33 people who got baptized and showed their faith in Christ. Anybody excited about that today? Yes. So uh, anybody ready to get resilient today? Anybody besides me ready to get a little more resilient and give it up? So check it out. Let me ask you a question. What do bonsais, billionaires, and the Bible have in common? We'll answer that as the teaching unfolds today. Let's start with bonsais. I told you a little illustration in a service, I guess, back in January when we were in 21 Days of Prayer series, and we had a service that was called The Ashes of the Fire, and I explained to you how the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan. And when that bomb was dropped, Hiroshima turned into a pile of ashes. The war was ended by the dropping of this bomb. When the bomb was dropped, over 80,000 people were immediately killed and many, many more from the fallout. But after this ash heap, experts said that there'll never again be plant life in Hiroshima. But the experts were wrong because some plants survived. And today, Hiroshima is filled with plant life. And there was one bonsai tree that survived the atomic bomb. And uh, this guy saved and preserved that bonsai tree, and he gave it to the United States as a gift. And today, this little bonsai tree, it's over 400 years old, and it's sitting in the National Arboretum in Washington, D.C., as a symbol of friendship and peace between the United States and Japan, and I couldn't get this little bonsai tree out of my head. And the reason I couldn't get it out of my head is because it reminded me of some of you. And here's why. Some of you in this very room and who are streaming this service online right now, you have been through emotional and spiritual bombs in your life. And somehow you've endured and what I hope to do in this series is to encourage you to continue to be resilient. You know, resilient means that you're able to withstand or recover quickly from difficult conditions. And that's what we're going to learn to do during this series is to be able to withstand and recover from these things. And this series is going to be very important. It could save your life or the life of someone that you invite to come to services during this series, and you know, I think what we all know is that we don't get to choose whether or not we're gonna experience pain in this life, right? I mean, we know it is inevitable, but what we can choose is to gain from it. And so that's why I wanna submit this one resilient idea to you today, and it is to choose to gain from pain. Choose to gain from pain. Shall we say it out loud together with passion and conviction when I point to you, ready, here we go. Choose to gain from pain. Let's try it one more time with a little more intensity. Choose to gain from pain. Very good. Now, 
This is picked up on by Malcolm Gladwell in his little book, David and Goliath. And in that book, he talks about the cognitive reflection test or the CRT test and tests people's IQs. And they're one of the little problems or little puzzles in the CRT test is this. I'll put it on screen for you. Here, here it goes. Just give me your first response. If a bat and a ball cost $1.10 in total, the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? What's your first response? Say it. 10 cents? Most of you. Well, that would be wrong. Actually, sorry, it's, a tr kind of, it's, it's not really, it's kind of a trick question, but if you guess 10 cents, that can't be right because the bat is supposed to cost a dollar more than the ball. So if the ball costs 10 cents, then the bat must cost a dollar 10. That would add up to a dollar 20, wouldn't it? Which would put us over the limit of 110, right? And so um, we, we've exceeded our total. So the ball has to cost five cents, doesn't it? So if you're still confused by the little puzzle, we're going to post a little YouTube video that'll help you get it because it took me a while. So don't feel bad on this one because 50% of Harvard students got this wrong. But you know how the researchers were able to increase the number of people that would get the puzzle right? They made it a little bit harder. They added an increment of pain. So what they did was they printed the question or the puzzle about the ball and the bat in 50% gray. And when people felt the pain of struggling to read it more, they thought more deeply about the problem. So the pain of reading caused them to gain deeper understanding of the question, see? So if you think about reading problems, one of the first ones that comes to mind is dyslexia, right? Well, there is a correlation between dyslexia and billionaires. You'd be surprised at the number of well-known billionaires who are dyslexics, like John Chambers, who was the CEO and founder of Cisco, the tech giant. And then there's also Richard Branson, the well-known British billionaire. And then there's Lady Delano, who uh, is a billionaire, brilliant guy, not only struggled with dyslexia, but also struggled in hearing in one of his ears. He was deaf in one of his ears. But the pain of having to read with dyslexia created the gain of success because these people were able to think more deeply about the problems that they dealt with in life. So in the little book by Malcolm Gladwell, he explains how one woman was standing up giving a keynote speech in front of a room that was filled with the most successful entrepreneurs in this country. And she had a raise of hand. She said, how many of you have ever struggled with dyslexia? And over half the room raised their hands. See? So what do billionaires, bonsais, and the Bible have in common? They all tell us that we can gain from our pains in this life. And so as we study through this series, we're going to give you this little handout. Did you get your little handouts when you came in the room today, which is a reading plan of First Peter? And we want you to read through First Peter with us several times during this series, not just one time, but several times. In fact, if you start today, and by the way, if you're online, we'll post the PDF version of this reading plan online so you can get it there as well. But if you read according to this plan, you'll have read through First Peter seven times in the next five weeks as we go through this series. And what you got to understand about First Peter is that this guy Peter wrote this little letter under Roman persecution, under the reign of Emperor Nero, who would eventually have Peter executed. So this guy Peter is a guy who knows a thing or two about suffering, about pain, because he endured and lived through the persecution of the day, and the Christians were being persecuted, and he knew that they would be persecuted even more in the future. So look at the purpose of his book in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12. He says, my purpose in writing is to encourage you and assure you that what you're experiencing, the suffering that's going on right now in your life, is truly a part of God's grace for you. And look at those next two little words. Stand firm. Stand firm in his grace. Standing firm means being resilient. It means we're not tossed around by every wind of doctrine or philosophy in our world. It means we stand firm even when the culture turns against us or disagrees with God and his word. And so we hope to deal with this issue with some encouragement. 
because Peter says, I want to encourage you here, right? If you're thinking about pain and suffering, and that's all you're thinking of, you can get bummed out, can't you? You'll want to leave church and listen to Depeche Mode or emo music or country music, you know? You'll leave here wanting to sing, my tractor won't run, and someone ran over my dog, you know? That's not what we want to do to you. We want to encourage you through these services, and so we hope to be able to encourage you to gain from pain, but let me show you the four concepts of resilience that are in the text for today. Number one, live like foreigners. Number two, live with resurrection expectations. Number three, embrace our secure inheritance. And number four, will be tested with fire. So let's go back and break down each one of them. Number one, live like foreigners. The Bible will say sometimes you live like exiles or aliens. When it says live like aliens, it doesn't mean we're joining some type of cult that's waiting on the spaceship to pick us up, you know, after we've all drank the special Kool-Aid or something like that, right? That's not, not what that's about. But look at what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. He says, this letter is from Peter, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm writing to God's chosen people who are living as what? Say that word. Foreigners. Living as foreigners in the province of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And so when we think about living as foreigners here in this world, I think about when I travel to other countries and when I go there, I live as a foreigner in other places because I know my home is here in San Antonio, Texas. When I get on the plane and I'm on my way home, I can't help but think about home. I'm thinking about what I'm going to do when I get home. I'm thinking about what I'm going to eat when I get home. I think, I'm going to give me some tacos. I really want some tacos when I get home, right? I want some, like, real good coffee like I can get here at home. I think about all the things that I love about home. And look, if you want to be able to endure like a bonsai tree, like the bonsai tree I described earlier, you have to think about home. Think about our eternal place in heaven. That is our home not this earth. And you know, a lot of Christians really mess this up, and here's why. Because they think, well, this earth is just going to burn anyway, so why shouldn't we just use up the environment and take from the earth? But we need to be the best stewards of the planet, shouldn't we? Leave it better than what we found it for future generations to be good neighbors to our kids and their kids and their kids' kids, right? Now, I was inspired by Mr. Yamaki, Masaru Yamaki. You can see pictured on screen if you're watching or in person. And this is the bonsai master who shaped and created the bonsai tree that I referenced earlier in the service and the teaching. And this master donated this important tree to the United States and the National Arboretum back in 1976 when the U.S. was celebrating our bicentennial. But at that time, nobody knew the story behind that bonsai tree. They didn't know that this bonsai master himself had lived through the atomic blast, that glass flew through his home and cut up his entire body, and that he had lost many friends and relatives in the atomic blast. They didn't know that until 2001 when this guy, Mr. Yamaki's grandsons, came to the United States and they told him the story of how this bonsai master had suffered himself and then brought this over as a symbol of peace and beauty. And so this man, Mr. Yamaki, traveled as a foreigner to our country and left us something that to this day represents peace and beauty. And isn't that what we should be doing as Christ followers in our world? Is that even when this world brings us so much pain, sometimes we give back symbols of peace and beauty. That is resilience. That is a resilient man that was able to give this bonsai tree. Now look at number two. To gain from our pain, we have to live with resurrection expectation. That comes in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, where Peter writes, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we've been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great, what? Say that word out loud. Expectation. We live with a whole new expectation in this life. And this was made clear to me when my wife and I went to the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. 
And we went there and it's a very intense emotional experience because they have all these displays that show pictures of people that were killed during the Holocaust when the Nazis were trying to exterminate all the Jews in the world. And you would see these pictures of these people and what was done to their homes and their businesses and their cities. And we see these like piles of shoes of people who had been murdered by the Nazis. And it's so intense emotionally. When you walk out, they have this garden that you walk through. You can sit down and just decompress from what you've just seen. I don't know if I have the words to relay to you how emotionally intense it is to walk through that Holocaust museum. It's significant. And one of the guys that survived one of the concentration camps is a guy that we all had to read about in college where I went, his name's Viktor Frankl. He wrote the book, Man's Search for Meaning. And he was in Auschwitz, I believe, the Nazi death camp. And he was a Jewish psychotherapist, so he couldn't help but watch how people reacted to the suffering they were experiencing in the concentration camps. And Viktor Frankl said that people would respond one of four ways to the torture there. One group of people would get brutal. You know why they would get brutal? Because their expectation was is that things were just going to get more violent and they had to return violence with violence in that experience. So their expectation was that things were going to get more violent. But then the second group was the group that lost hope. Their expectation was that it was never ever going to get better and they lost all hope of anything getting better. And Viktor Frankl tells you a story about people that just lay in their bed and they would just die there because they had no hope that anything was getting better. And the third group of people is that they held on to the expectation of getting their life back. They held on to the hope that, hey, maybe they could just endure the concentration camp. They could get out afterwards and they could get their homes back, maybe their family back, maybe some of their wealth back, some of their positions and jobs and things like that. And you know what happened with the third group of people? Many of them, after the war, committed suicide. Because they got their jobs back, they got their families, they got their lives back, and it didn't fill them the way they thought it would, and so they ended their lives. And then the fourth group of people were the people that kept their inner liberty. You know how they kept their inner liberty? They had come to the foundation of what they believed, because suffering, concentration camps, get you to the end of yourself and tell you really what your foundation is for fulfillment in life. And people that are able to make it through are people that have a foundation of an expectation that is beyond this lifetime. They have a hope that transcends this reality, this life. They have what we call a resurrection expectation. Let me illustrate it like this. My wife loves me, but I am not my wife's ultimate hope. I am not her foundation for fulfillment, see? And I'll tell you why. Because if you look at one of our wedding pictures back in the day when we got married many years ago, you can see I look a lot different, don't I? You know why? Because I'm fading. I'm decaying. I'm gonna die. I'm slowly dying. We were looking at some old pictures and Jeannie was telling me, you were chiseled. And I said, what do you mean you were chiseled, okay? <laughs> it's like, now there's just more of me to chisel away, isn't there? But see, what she knows is, if she's gonna depend upon me, I'm gonna fade away someday. And if you love your spouse, your spouse is gonna leave you someday one way or the other, they'll die. I'm not my wife's ultimate hope, and she is not mine, but the resurrected Christ is our hope. And if you live long enough, you'll see everything you hold dear fade away. Some of you love your kids, but they're gonna leave. Some of you are like, I wish they'd hurry up and leave. They cost me more money, you know what I mean? Your spouse, your kids, someday they're gonna leave. Your hobbies, the things you enjoy doing, there'll come a day where you can't do them. Some of you are like me. I love my career. I love what I do. I love being your pastor. I love teaching you the word of God, but you know I can't do this forever. I will fade away. It won't last. 
Just like my health and your health won't last. We're all fading. We're all dying. That's a real pick-me-up, isn't it? But look, <laughs> you know how we'll be like the bonsai and make it through when we lose all that we hold dear because we have a resurrection expectation. We're looking forward to something far better than just our hobbies, our health, our jobs, our careers, our fulfillment, right on? Yeah, isn't that good? So we should have the most hope because we have expectation where Jesus resurrected from the dead and he goes, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you can be also. And when we go there, we'll be there to experience the joy and pleasure in his presence that's beyond anything that our finite minds can even comprehend. We can't even understand how great it's going to be then. So that's what gets us through the atomic blasts of this world, the loss and all that we experience. But look at number three. We gain from our pain when we embrace our secure inheritance. Our secure inheritance. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, where Peter says, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. So lots of us, we invest for the future, don't we? Like we, some of us have 401ks, and those 401ks are probably diversified in the stock market. Do you think the stock market is always going to be okay? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Some of us have been paying into Social Security for years, haven't we? We ought to call it social insecurity because I don't know if we're going to get that stuff. You know what I'm saying? Look, we've got these bank accounts and pension funds and all this kind of stuff, but can we really rely on that stuff? But listen to what Peter said. He said, hey, you've got an inheritance. You've got investment in the kingdom that will always be there. Look, in America, we don't even know if our government's going to show up and be open sometimes, right? Sometimes our government shut down. But in heaven, he never shuts down. Look, look, he never shuts down, right? And some of you feel guilty right now because of stuff you've done. You think your relationship with him is dependent upon what you've done and your ability to keep a good track record? It's dependent upon what Jesus did on the cross for you and it's secured. You're in the hand of Jesus. Jesus is in the hand of God and no one can snatch you out of his hands. I don't care what you did on Friday night. I don't want you to do what you did on Friday night, but you, you know, I don't care what you do. You're secured, your relationship with him. Look, when you are generous with other people, when you serve God, he stores up rewards for you in heaven and they are absolutely secured. They don't need to be FDIC insured. They are absolutely secured in heaven for you. Now let's review for a minute. Look back at number one. Live like foreigners. We wanna be resilient. We live like foreigners here in, on earth. Number two, live with resurrection expectation. Resurrection is our hope in the future in Jesus. Number three, embrace our secure inheritance. We can make it through because we've got a, a great inheritance waiting on us. And then the last one that we're going to talk about is not really something we can do. And it's not even a mentality we can have. It's just a reality that reveals. And it's being tested by fire. We are... Some of us have been and going to be tested by fire. Go with me to verse 7. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 7, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials... It will bring God? No. It'll bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. So it brings you praise like a bonsai, a symbol of his grace in the world as you've endured through your atomic blasts in this life. Now, suffering 
can make you stronger. You've heard people say, you know, suffering makes you stronger or whatever. Well, it doesn't always, but it can. But another thing that suffering always does is it reveals who you really are. You think God takes you through a test so he can figure out who you are? No, God already knows who you are, right? Never, nothing ever occurred to God. Think about that. He already knew it. He doesn't, nothing occurs to him because he already knows everything. He reveals who you and I are when we suffer. So when we go through fiery trials, we're like, oh, that's who I really am, see? So I saw this survey a few years ago, and the survey was about what makes people grow spiritually. What do they do that makes them really grow spiritually? And I was kind of surprised by the results of the survey. They surveyed all these people, asked them what helped them grow spiritually, and no, you know, they didn't say that the main thing that made them grow spiritually was going through Bible studies and groups and classes and stuff, even though those are good to do. Uh, they didn't always just grow spiritually through generosity or giving or serving in the community or going to a prayer room or extended worship experiences, you know, and all those things are good and, and certainly made the list, but you know the number one thing that makes people grow spiritually? Suffering. It's the thing that none of us want to do, but it makes us grow spiritually the most. And when we suffer, it leads us to the prayer room and worship in the classes and the groups and the like so that we'll grow spiritually, see? You know, when Peter writes these words about being tested by fire, I wonder if he was thinking about a story from the Old Testament that he would have certainly known it's the Old Testament story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The three young men who were thrown into the fiery furnace by the evil king that wanted them to bow down to his golden image in that country, Babylon. And they wouldn't, and they stood up to the king. And they said, look, king, we know our God is able to save us. But you know what they said next? But even if he does not, we will not bow down to your idol. We will not bow down. And they were thrown into the fiery furnace. And they endured the fiery furnace and came out alive and well because of the fourth man in the fire, Jesus, our resurrection expectation, the resurrected Jesus, the Jesus who was alive. See? And we honor Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego today like the bonsai trees that they are because they were resilient. And sometimes in our world, we have to say, we will not bow down to your values. Even if it means we're gonna have to go into the fire, even if it means people are gonna talk crap about us, and microaggressions and even all out persecution. We will not bow down, but we will, as Peter says, stand firm because of our relationship with him. That's how we become bonsais. You know, I learned a lot about suffering from a pastor and author, Tim Keller, who has a current cancer diagnosis. He has pancreatic cancer. And here's what he said. This is a guy that's done it all. He said, you don't realize Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. That's the truth. Some of you are feeling that right now. It's like, man, so many things have screwed up in my life right now. And now you realize Jesus is what you have that cannot be taken away. He won't fade. He'll be there. He's secure. See? So as I was thinking about our prayer time that we're going to have at the end of the service, because a lot of times if you're new, we have these times where we invite you to walk down here and kneel and pray at the front on the rugs. You can also do it back behind the soundboard on the rugs there. And I was thinking about the significance of our prayer time today, because I have a glimpse into your lives and know that some of you have gone through some very, very hard times. The loss of people to death, loss of relationships. I could go on and on and on and on. And it reminded me of an experience that Jeannie and I had when we went to Jerusalem and we went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there's a rock there that they built 
this chapel over the top, a cathedral, if you will. It's called the Rock of Anguish because it's believed that that's where Jesus knelt down in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed with such intensity that blood was coming out of his pores. And our tour group went in there to that chapel, that cathedral, and we sat the bench next to the wall quietly, just kind of reflected on what Jesus was going through when he prayed there. And then everyone was interrupted when the Koreans got there. Those Korean believers came into that place and they didn't sit quietly back there on the benches. They converged on that rock and they cried and they prayed with intention. They touched the rock with passion and conviction. They're praying to their risen Lord. So you know what I did? I left my group. I don't know if the bus, I didn't know if the bus was gonna leave or I left my group and I went and prayed with them because I wanted to pray like they pray. And the reason I told you that is because sometimes when you wanna gain spiritually, you have to get up from your chair and leave your group. See? And when you come and pray here in just a minute, you gotta, you can't just praise. And I'll tell you why. Because praise is sometimes inauthentic unless it's preceded by lament. You know what lament means? It means you get honest and raw and real with God and you let God have it for what's going on in your life. Some of you need to come down here before you can praise, you need to say, God, I don't understand. I thought that when I became a Christian, I would have life and have it to the full and all that stuff. I thought I'd be a new creation, but I'm still struggling with my sin, God. I'm still struggling with my addiction, God. Or God, I didn't try to make that relationship go away. It just went away. God, why did my dad have to die when I was so young? God, why do I have to go through PTSD? God, I didn't want to suffer like this. I'm trying to do everything right. Why am I feeling what I'm feeling? And why aren't things better for me right now? now to lay it out and after you've lamented then you praise because lament plus praise equals gain in the kingdom economy and I can tell you this if you lay it out raw to God he can take it he can take it then you can praise with authenticity so let's stand together now and as you're compelled by God's Spirit, if you're worshiping at home, you can kneel on the carpets at home. And if you're here and compelled by God to do so, join me in prayer at the front. dead 
we've come before you and laid things out the way we feel and we've been straight, straightforward with you. We can trust that you know about our reality because you didn't just stay in heaven where it was safe, but you came down to earth. 
Jesus, you were born in a manger, a dirty manger in our reality, and you saw the violence and the sin of our world firsthand. And you received upon yourself every bit of guilt, shame, pain, disgust, hurt, wounding upon yourself on the cross. So we, Jesus, we know that the physical part of the cross was not the worst part. It was all the rest, emotionally and spiritually, that came upon you from our sin. And so because of that, we can receive healing in you. Thank you. And Jesus, I can't help but think that you brought someone here to adopt as your kid, as your daughter, your son. And if you've never had a relationship with God through Jesus, I want you to just talk to him in your own heart right now and just say something like this. Hey, look, God, I know that you and I hadn't always seen eye to eye and that I've sinned. But right now, the best I understand it, I am choosing to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin and he rose again from the dead. And I receive Jesus now as my hope, my resurrection expectation. Welcome into my life. Anybody receiving a little encouragement from the Holy Spirit today? Just clap or raise your hand or indicate it in some way right on. Thank you, Jesus, for the good work you're doing all across our church. And we pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everyone said, amen, A to the men. You guys go ahead and take a seat just for a minute. And as we wrap up today, uh, don't forget to come on back next week because we're going to study 1 Peter chapter 2 two and learn more about resilience next Sunday. Also, I want to say a brief word about Fireside today after the second service. So it'll be around two o'clock today. You can go by Fireside and check that out and learn about City Tribe Church and how you can be a part here. Now, as we think about our financial stewardship and leveraging our resources here today to serve God's kingdom's purposes, we always talk about bringing here like the first fruit tithe at the local storehouse. And I can I tell you this past week, I found out about something that you guys gave to that was so significant for me. Our, our students at City Youth all received these study Bibles this past week as a part of their package. And by the way, if you're a middle or high school student, City Youth is like growing these days and doing well and, and, and awesome things are happening. It's exciting, isn't it? But check it out. All of our students, you, you bought study Bibles for all of our students through your tithes and offerings this week. And you know why that touched me? Is because when I was a teenager, a guy gave me a, a study Bible. I still have it. Um, and it's falling apart. But can I tell you that that Bible kept me from falling apart many times because I read it, the encouragement that God gives through it. And look, some of the students know the treasure that they have and others will find out years from now when they read that book that's gonna get them through. So I wanted to say thank you for investing in students, the word of God. You deposited that for your offerings, right on? So. Here's how we do our offerings at City Tribe Church. We don't pass buckets or plates or anything, but the way we get it done is you can donate by mail. You can mail it to the P.O. box that's on screen. You can donate online at citytribe.church slash tithe. You can also text to tithe. You just text the number on screen, 74483. Text the word tribe space, the dollar amount, and press send. Or you can donate in person at the giving stations that are located near the exits of the theater. And so before you guys worship through your generosity, let's stand up together, put a hand out in a position to receive from the Holy Spirit. So dear brothers and sisters, as you walk from this place, may you walk from here with your resurrection expectation, knowing that the inheritance that he gives to you cannot be stolen, cannot be swindled away, but it's secured for you in heaven. And look, dear brothers and sisters, as you walk from here, may you walk from here like bonsai trees that though you've gone through the atomic blasts of this life, you will endure, you will stand firm because of the good Lord Jesus that lives with you and in you. You guys have an amazing Sunday. We'll see you next time. Peace.